Welcome to EECS 3342. In this course, we're going to learn about how you can specify a refined system in a rigorous and mathematical way. Specifically, we're going to use the constructs about discrete math that you learn from EECS 1090, including propositions, predicates, set theory, and also some proof techniques. And that's something we will definitely give you more details and elaborates throughout the course. But for part two of this week, I'll just give you a little bit of review on the basics that you're at least uh, you should really know uh, in order to really proceed uh, smoothly uh, with this course. Any additional review on the math will be uh, done uh, as we actually go along with the case studies. Let's now start with the part one for this week. Uh, uh, for which I just want to give you a very brief introduction to like uh, how we can contextualize this course in the bigger picture for you to become a uh, professional engineer upon your graduation. That's something I would like to do. And then we'll move on to the math review. All right, let's now start with the learning outcomes. So this module is really, really designed to help you understand uh, several terms. And of course, we will actually uh, revisit those terms by giving you concrete example. But for this uh, lecture uh, for this part of the lecture, it's just mainly to give you definition and give you some ideas, some intuition. So we want to define what a safety critical system is. And of course, there's another uh, subsequent course to this one called the 40 uh, EECS 4315, the safety, co uh, safety, uh, safety critical system. And in that course, you will definitely learn more. But in this course, we'll build some foundation for that. And I want to talk about the code of ethics uh, for professional engineers. Every one of you who uh, who will graduate from this course, uh, will graduate from your degree, you're going to be a software engineer, which is definitely part of the professional engineering uh, discipline. In that case, I would like to remind you about what will be the code of ethics that you're supposed to obey and why this course can be relevant to that particular big ideal. We'll talk about it. And what a formal method is, you may have heard about the term very often, but what does that really mean? It has a very simple definition, easy to say. However, when you really want to practice that, it does require lots of discipline and also knowledge. And that's something we'll try to help you uh, practice and also learn in this course. And we'll talk about also two buzzwords about verification versus validation. And in this course, we are mainly doing verification. And I'll, but I'll definitely explain uh, what validation really is. And there is another relevant uh, course that you might take uh, later. I'll point out that uh, point that out to you later. And also, we're going to talk about model-based system development. That's really the approach that we are adopting for this course. Especially, we're going to do lots of uh, model construction. And let me clarify, first of all, I might just repeat these points uh, later. So the model that we are talking about in this course really means a, an abstract. Uh, description of your system. Rather than writing Java code like a classes, attributes, and methods, we want to construct a more abstract uh, description of your system by filtering, uh, by eliminating, by filtering out the irrelevant detail so that you'll be much easier for you to actually see the properties and hopefully prove them. As opposed to maybe in EECS 1090, whenever you, you talk about model, you're simply trying to construct a satisfying, what, uh, like a conforming instance of certain axiom or theorem. That's not what we are doing here. That's not what we really meant. So model is just a description of your system, but it's abstract by filtering out all the details. That's something I want to clarify first. That's what we meant by model in this course. All right, let's now talk about some definition. Uh, let's start by safety critical system. Right, uh, you can kind of guess literally what safety critical really means. That means uh, the safety uh, is really a priority when you actually build a system. Okay, a safety critical system or SCS uh, for short is a system if it fails or malfunction, it has one or more of the following consequences, and each one of them is really disastrous if it ever happens. It could be a uh, death or serious injury to people or it could be loss or severe damage to equipment or property, or it could be harm to the environment. Each one of them is something that uh, you as a professional engineer, if you stamp your professional uh, credential on a piece of paper for the blueprint for the system, but the system actually goes wrong, you will be responsible for the loss, okay? So that's why we want to be very careful uh, when we actually develop the uh, safety safety critical safety critical system as a professional engineer. That's something I want you to uh, just keep in mind. So that's the definition for safety critical system. And let's talk about 
you as a professional engineer, there is certain code of conduct that you have to actually obey, right? And the one I'm quoting, I'll give you the reference at the end. The one, uh, the code I'm quoting is the professional engineers of Ontario, since this is a province we're currently living. And other other uh, provinces or other countries also got the idea about professional engineers code of ethics. It will be a similar idea. Let's see one example over here. So code of ethics is a, the basic guidance for professional conducts, meaning that your conducts for system development cannot be uh, cannot be informal, cannot be uh, fuzzy. It has to be professional and imposes duties on practitioners with respect to society, employers, clients, and colleagues, and also the engineering profession of and him or herself, right? So you're, you have, uh, you're responsible for many parties, including yourself, all right? It, it will be the duty for the practi uh, practitioner to act at all times with, let me go over the list very quickly. You want to be fair, you want to be loyal to uh, your associates, employers, clients, uh, subordinates, and also employees, right? And also you gotta be uh, loyal, uh, fidel to public needs, meaning that whatever you do must be with, uh, must be related to the best of the public interest. Also you want to de be, uh, be devoted to high ideals. And this is really important. You want to make sure whatever products you actually produce, for example, like a model of the system must be carefully thought out and hope uh, ideally maybe proved, right? As far as this course is concerned. And also you want to have uh, up-to-date knowledge and then you want to make sure whatever decision you actually uh, make, you must be uh, the up-to-date. Uh, it must be based uh, on the up-to-date knowledge, right? Make sure it's uh, properly justified. And you want, you want to remain competent, right? You want to just make sure you I got lifelong learning and make sure you're always kept up to date about the latest uh, technique to build reliable system, for example. All right, what will be the consequence if you got misconduct, if you fail any one of them, right? So if you're licensed, in that case, you might just get your license suspe uh, suspended or terminated, or you might even get lawsuits. If you, you remember that one of the consequences for uh, the safety uh, critical system malfunction or failure, right? It can re, uh, result in uh, either uh, injury to people or damage to property or damage to the environments. Each one of them is gonna cost you maybe some lawsuits. So you really want to make sure you do things uh, with uh, the best knowledge and also with the best diligence. All right, so what I'm quoting over here is the uh, Code of Ethics from Professional Engineers Ontario. You can definitely click on the link and this is what I have, uh, have just quoted. You can definitely take a look. So that's the uh, website for Professional Engineers Ontario, which is very relevant to uh, many of you. All right, let's now move on. And when we, uh, how do we develop a safety, uh, safety critical system uh, with a profession? How do we do that? So industrials, there are industrial standards which uh, uh, relevant parties actually publish for people to actually follow. And they actually de uh, define acceptance criteria, meaning that when will your system be acceptable uh, if you want to put, put it into use? Okay, it's uh, talk about safety critical system. And so I'm uh, just quoting two standards for you. One is from the aviation domain. The other one is from the nuclear domain. Of course, you don't really need to read uh, these two standards. I just want to bring to your attention. So in different uh, safety critical domain, they publish uh, industrial standards for the practitioners to really follow. If they don't follow it, and when they actually got the system malfunction or failed, they will be held responsible for not following the standard. Okay, one is called RTCA DO170AC. Okay, it's the, uh, basically just for the uh, aviation domain, right? Just the name. And of course, for those of you who might be interested, you can definitely Google for this, uh, the standard name over here, and then, or maybe the name over here. And then you might be able to find some pub, uh, some publication related to the standard. Usually the standard will, uh, you will be, uh, to really uh, get the full access to the standard, you will have to pay certain uh, certain fee, but it's not necessary for, the, for this course. But at least you can maybe find some secondhand uh, reference that's published related to the standard if you're interested, optional. And the other uh, standard is in the nuclear domain. It's IEEE 7, uh, 7432. It's the criteria actually for building uh, nuclear power generating stations, right? That's also very uh, uh, relevant to safety critical for sure, 
well, you definitely don't want the uh, the uh, let's say OPG Ontario pow power generation of uh, of uh, for their product to actually fail. It's definitely not good for our lives. Well, overall, so there are two important criteria across the domains about when the system should be acceptable. Let me just uh, mention them to you. One is the system requirements are precise and also complete, meaning that before you build your system, the requirements for the functionality of the system must be clear, must be precise, and must be complete. You shouldn't miss any important details, right? That's about requirements. So whenever we talk about requirements, you can think about the analogy is whenever you want to do a lab, you want to do a test, you want to do a maybe exam, the requirements is really what you were given as instructions. So the instruction themselves must be precise and complete. Number one, okay? Number two, the implementation of the requirements, of course, you must make you must make sure it, uh, the implementation conforms to the requirements, right? So let's say requirements ask you to do X, but somehow you do Y for implementation. Oh, to be more concre uh, concrete, requirement is for you to sort an array, but somehow the implementation is simply to print hello world. Of course, that's not conforming, right? Of course, we'll do much more sophisticated example than hello world in this course. But how do we uh, accomplish uh, these uh, criteria? So we have a particular skill that actually is very promising and also recommended by the industry, by the industrial part, uh, by the uh, safety critical domain. Let's take a look. Well, what we what we can use is something called formal method or FM for short. So what's really the formal method? The, the definition itself is incredibly easy and straightforward. So always remember what the definition is for formal method. And in this course, 3342, we'll teach you one particular formal method for uh, which is called, uh, which is the category of theorem proving. And in the subsequent course to this, EECS 4315, uh, which is about safety critical system, you'll learn about another uh, formal method called model checking, right? That's something uh, just put you in the context for your degree. So what is a formal method? A formal method is a mathematically rigorous technique. So then here, that is heavily math, right? So if you're good in math, especially 1090, then I think in this course, you will definitely enjoy about applying the math to building some reliable system models, okay? Mathematically rigorous technique for the uh, specification, developments, and verification of software and hardware system. So in this course, we're gonna focus for sure on specification of the models and also a verification, meaning that we wanna prove properties of your model. And development over here typically is referring to maybe a uh, coding, like a writing Java code, Python code, assembly code for your system. But we don't really do any coding in this course. So we are focusing on mainly specification and also verification. But we'll definitely get uh, more details to you later. Right, so this is another standard over here. It's the basically the uh, it's a DO uh, 333. It's actually a supplement to the aviation standard I mentioned in earlier in the slides. And this standard here actually adv advocates the use of formal methods. So you may have heard about sometimes industrial people might say, just get it work. So math, we simply don't have time to be rigorous. We don't have time to really do proofs. We don't have time to really uh, even to be uh, mathematical. That's not true actually. So let's take a look. So here, this is a direct quote from the standard. Let's read it together. It's actually very important to really justify why formal methods will be actually useful, even when you jump into industry. The use of formal methods or the use of rigorous mathematics is motivated by the expectation that, as in other engineering disciplines, for example, civil engineering, math, uh, mechanical engineering, and etc., Performing appropriate mathematical analysis can contribute to establishing the correctness and robustness of, uh, robustness of a design. So this is something we'll definitely keep practicing in this course. We want to make sure every time we try to uh, specify our system, it should be amendable, it should be applicable to mathematical analysis, especially doing the proofs that you actually learn in 1090, maybe in a slightly different uh, form, but the, uh, the overall, the underlying idea is really the same. We want to uh, specify your system in a way that's precise and also complete and also uh, amendable to actually formal analysis, mathematical proof. Okay. And formal methods, because of their mathematical rigor and basis, they're capable of 
So this is to address the two acceptance criteria I just mentioned in the earlier slides. So you can un unambiguously describing software to system requirements. Un unambiguously simply means when you actually specify your uh, requirements using math, there should be no multiple imp uh, interpretations of what you uh, what you write. For example, if I simply say my system requirement is I want to make sure the union of the two uh, constructs are really done, and the union operator is a very well defined mathematical operator that should be there should be no uh, other interpretation. So there should be no ambiguity over there, right? We'll definitely see more what I really meant. So whenever we see the system model, as we go through the course, once you see the system construct, as long as you understand what a mathematical operator really mean, you will be able to understand what a system really is supposed to function, okay? And enable precise communication between engineer. And since everything is unambiguous, so whenever you send your system model to another colleague, or maybe your customer, they should be able to understand precisely what you really meant. There should be no miscommunication. On the other hand, if you only try to exchange about the requirements using natural language, maybe English, maybe other any uh, any of your mother tongues, in that case, natural language is very notorious for uh, that will leaving lots of scope for ambiguity and interpretation. If the uh, if uh, if your collaborator actually got different interpretation of how the system should be implemented as uh, as yours. In that case, you, you guys cannot really uh, work uh, together very well, right? That's uh, straightforward. And also, formal method can really help us provide verification evidence. So if you build your system with uh, precision and also with uh, uh, without any ambiguity, so you will be able to prove some properties about the uh, system model. In that case, the fact that you have completed the proof will be a very good evidence with high confidence. So it could be, uh, so th uh, these two bullet points will be something that we're gonna uh, elaborate further, but very quickly. So the verification evidence can show that your system model a formal representation that's really important. We are trying to represent the system using math, using uh, something with rigor. So the formal represent representation of the system is healthy. I will elaborate what really uh, what healthy really means. It's, it simply means some basic property, right? For example, at least the system itself is type correct. You are not really trying to add, for example, integer to, uh, maybe you are not really adding integer to, uh, string. Or maybe you're not really trying to use an integer value, uh, integer variable where it's out of bound, where you're not trying to access to the array where the index is actually not valid. Something like that. The healthiness property. And beyond healthiness property, there will be something so-called safety property. For example, if you're building the system model of a train system, where trains will actually go uh, departure from the platform and they will also arrive into the platform of the uh, uh, train station, you want to make sure. Uh, there's no collision. In that case, collision-free, uh, collision freedom is a safety property. 